of the best ways to really get to know a country is to walk it. Did you know that Europe has thousands of walking trails, both easy and challenging, weaving all across the continent? Best of all, there are companies who can move your luggage, so all you have to do is walk with a day pack. You end the day with a hot shower in a comfy inn and a great meal after leisurely walking from one often medieval village to the next. It's one of my favorite ways to travel. On today's show, I interview Margaret, who's gone on numerous walking holidays, and pick her brain about how to take one of these amazing adventures. I can't wait to share it with you, so let's get started. Welcome to the Active Travel Adventures podcast. I'm your host, Kit Parks. I first discovered walking holidays when my Scottish friend Jamie invited me and my Nicaraguan hiking group to his 40th birthday party in Fort William, Scotland. It was going to be a hiking party, and of course I said yes. I mean, how often can you get to hang out with a bunch of Scots, right? But it didn't make sense to fly to Scotland just for a weekend, so I looked around to see what else I could do while I was over there, and I discovered a trail called the West Highland Way, Scotland's most popular long-distance trail. And it ran from just outside of Glasgow, where Jamie lived, all the way to Fort William, where the party was. Kismet. I would just spend eight days walking the roughly 100 miles to the birthday party. You can hear all about my walking holiday in episode number three. I'll put a link in the show notes. That was way back in 2018, and that got me hooked on this fun and affordable way to see a country up close. There are companies, including my affiliate One Foot Abroad, that can make all the arrangements for you. You simply pick which trail, which country you want to go to, tell them the pace you want to hike, and in some cases bike, and then they'll book your accommodations, usually around three star, but you can also work with them here as well. They'll arrange for your luggage to be picked up each morning and transported to your next accommodations and provide you with your itinerary, a map, 24-7 support should you need it, and often they'll even meet you on the ground before you head out just to go over everything with you in person. And remember, if you go with One Foot Abroad, use my exclusive promo code ATA5, A-T-A-5, and get 5% off of any of their tours, and this code also works for their sister company, Follow the Camino, which offers self-guided tours of the many El Camino routes. Since these walking tours are self-guided, you can save a ton of money because you don't have a guide. You're the guide, and they make it super easy for you to be your own guide. Walking tours are a great way to meet fellow international travelers as well as locals. They might be out walking their dog or getting the kids some fresh air. So again, I've asked Margaret, whom we met on our last episode, when she told us about section hiking, the Via Algarviana, to come back on the program and give us a scoop on walking holidays. I brought Margaret back on the program today because when we were talking about her recent Portugal adventure, I found that she'd done multiple long distance hikes. And I thought, you know, it's been a long time since we'd really talked about walking holidays in general. And she had such a a great perspective to bring to the table. So I asked her to come back on and tell us about it. Thanks for coming back on the program, Margaret. Yeah, thank you. To give us an overview, and, and for those that may not have heard your first episode, could you perhaps tell us your age and how you got into all this kind of walking holidays? Yeah, sure. So I'm in my early 60s. And how did I get started doing these long distance hikes? Well, the, the background is this. Many years ago, it was actually in the 80s, the Sierra Club published a book, these two women did a point-to-point hike in Europe on the GR5, the Grand Randonnée Sank, which is one of Europe's great long-distance walking routes that actually goes from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. And I read this all one winter. I was entranced by this. And my husband at the time said, well, why don't we do it? So we actually took leaves from our jobs. This is before we had children and we couldn't quite pull off the time to do the entire thing, but we started on the Belgian Netherlands border and we walked to Nice. Wow. So it was 1200 kilometers and we took, I think it was like a hundred days. Wow. So Uh we got started in doing this point to point long distance walk in a grand style. Definitely. Yeah, as it happens, we later on moved to Europe for work. This was quite a, a unrelated thing to Switzerland, where we did quite a lot of hiking. By then we had children. 
And I always wanted, again, to do more point-to-point -point walking. I love this pattern, you might say, in Europe, where it really seemed to me that Europe was settled at a walking pace. So you would walk a half a day and there's a village and you walk another half a day, you know, and there's the next one or a town or towns were bigger towns were two, two days walk away, for example. And I really liked the in and out of countryside and then the villages or a town. I really liked the back and forth between the more, we were even in some wilderness parts. And then we crossed the Alps doing this trip where we were, the villages weren't quite so close together, but I really liked this style in Europe. So then later on, when we were living in Europe, I started doing, especially with my son, more shorter point to point trips in Switzerland, like maybe from hut to hut in the mountains. The Camino Way we think of as being primarily in Spain and France and so on, but people, when they were going to Santiago in medieval times, they started from wherever they were in Europe. And so they're actually feeder routes from all over Europe. And so my son and I started doing over time, the main path through Switzerland. And we would do I mean, some, a lot of it we could do as little day hikes from our own home, but then later we, it got farther away and we would do two or three days strong other. Then a, two friends and I did a, a walking trip in Ireland. This was the first time that I used service that carried our luggage from place to place. Well, we just carried a day pack and boy, I never looked back. I'm a total convert to. Hallelujah uh, moment, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> to, yeah. Well, you got what you need with you, but you got clean clothes waiting for you. And there's no risk that they're going to get wet or dirty or whatever, a change of shoes, all of that. And that was on the single peninsula in Ireland. And then one of those friends and I threw a yoga retreat, a place in Ireland that we went to that was a yoga walking holiday, but it was just little day hikes. We did a Camino, a guided Camino way trip that was the Portuguese way in Spain, where we started on the Portugal, Spain, born on the coast, and then made our way north and then inland to Santiago. And this was a guided thing, and but another one where our stuff was lapped. And it was through that trip that I found the company that organized the trip that my daughter and I did in early 2020 in Portugal. And who is that? That's called Follow the Camino or One Foot Abroad. And do you recommend them? Very much so. They gave super good advice, personalized on the trip that my daughter and I took in Portugal. They were a trip you can book and do self-guided, but they really helped us think through which part to do, what would fit our needs, what were we looking for, the accommodations that they found for us really were great. Same on this Camino Way trip. And they used a local service in Portugal that um, specializes in like sustainable tourism, which I quite appreciated. Nice. So you're a fan of walking holidays. So you find the appeal in the slowing down of the travel or, or in a nutshell, why walking holidays versus say, going to doing the city touring or what's the big draw that keeps making you go back and back and back? Yeah, that's a thoughtful question. For me, the pace of walking is you really absorb where you are and what you're seeing. You don't get far, but where you are, you really take it in at that slow pace. I also think if you're by yourself, it's very reflective. If you're with someone else or many others, it's very companionable that you have conversations and maybe make up silly songs or whatever, but it's at a very relaxed, what I would consider to be a human pace. Now, don't get me wrong because I love cities and I love art museums and going to cathedrals. I love city trips too. So I think this is another way of exploring a place. I don't personally like bike riding that much. And so people often ask, why don't you take a bike ride? You would see so much more. <laughs>
and maybe not such hard work. I personally am not that big a bike rider, but there are times in these long distance or point to point hikes where you couldn't do them with the bike. You end up crossing these streams or going over hills or whatever that wouldn't work with the bike. That's really a personal thing for me. I think that biking probably has much of the same, but things are still whizzing by. There's something about the walking pace that I find very restorative and absorbing. And I think it was Chris Henning on my Galapagos episode who she quoted somebody else. I'm going to quote, quote, a quote about when you're either biking or walking on a holiday, you're actually part of the environment. You're part of all the people's days that you encounter versus if you're touring in a city in a group, you're like it, looking at a fishbowl looking in, but you're actually part of the landscape. And it's a I think that's really an astute observation. And I have so many examples of encountering people at this very slow pace, especially out in the countryside, especially on routes that aren't as popular, where people are just interested in you. What are you doing? Where are you going? I mean, they know what you're doing because they live on a walking route, but they're like, how did you get here? And why did you decide this? And people offering you something to eat or drink or on this Camino way thing that we were doing in, in this more obscure part of the route, there was a farmer who came and gave us all a little clover to say, these are all good luck for you. I mean, just these little encounters where people's primary thing, they might appreciate the tourism, but that isn't their whole thing. And they're not as worn out by tourists, I think, which I totally appreciate how tiring that must be to <laughs> constantly have only visitors passing through yeah. And one of the things that you encounter in parts of Europe, I think this isn't going to be the case so much into the future, but there are places like walking in Belgium and so on, where people would say, especially older people, they remember the Americans' effort in World War II. And thank you. They're still thanking us. And that's something that I don't think happens in an encounter, you know, a passing encounter in a museum. And, and also, too, the farmer that gave you the clovers probably told his wife that day, oh, I met these really nice people on the trail today and I gave it. So you're, you're part of the conversation of his life. Yes. Uh, so yes. he's just not your memory. You're his memory as well. So and I remember one incident in a little town in France, it kind of a, a little bit in the mountains, but not completely in the mountains when my husband at the time and I were doing this, where there were these little kids playing and they wanted to talk to us and we had only travel French. Actually, our French quite improved over this time, it, which was fun, but they wanted to have more of a conversation than we could have. And so we explained we don't speak French. And these little kids were, well, why not? I mean, they were so blown away. Like, how could adults not speak French? And you perfectly well that they went home and told their parents, we just met these crazy adults who can't speak French. What's that all about? Oh, and another time there was a little kid in a village who showed us that he had an American nickel with a buffalo on it. And could we explain to him what, what all about this buffalo? And so it's these kind of, I think you're right, that I really, especially maybe I think of it more with the children, that then they take this on as, here are these people who pass through my life and in this intriguing way. And, and off, because I think you were right too, that these paths were village to village because they built the village around where people could get to. And so these are actually the old ancient trade routes and walking routes and the drovers paths and the, the military. Routes. So all these things have been woven together in this really cool network throughout Europe, which yes. Is, yes. Is, and then there are, that's where the village is because that's as far as your old legs could get you that day. Yeah. So somebody put up a little inn there and then probably exactly. somebody put up, up and, and a little town sprouted up. Right. So, with all of the massive amounts of trails that you could choose throughout Europe, how do you pick? I, I know how you picked the Algarve because you wanted the heat, but there's so many trails. How, I mean, and you've done, rattle off some of the trail, the trails that you've done long distance wise. 
So Europe has these long distance numbered paths. It's a wonderful network with consistent signage and so on. So the GR5 is this long, there's, those are the Grand Randonnées, these really long distance multi-country paths. So did most of the GR5. And then, then this one in the Algarve, via Algarviana, is also a long distance path. So the reason I'm saying that is to point out some, done the whole thing, some little segments. So so how to choose. I think that it's like choosing where do you want to visit next? It's like, where have I already been? What would be a new place to explore? Some of it I think is confidence because some things are maybe easier than, than others. What do my companions want to do? I think that's an important um, Have you ever gone solo? Have you ever walked one solo? I have done. Yes, I have. In Switzerland? And, but can I just say, I was always a bus or train ride away from my home. Right. <laughs> so it'd be like, ooh, the weather's turned bad. I'm going home now. So I've never done a long trip by myself. No, I've always been with other people. Late, well, actually, I think only, I've only been doing this since I've been solo. And I have not felt uncomfortable safety-wise or the boogeyman-wise or anything on any of these trails. Did you ever feel that this would be not a good idea for a solo person to do on any of the trails that you're on? No, I would feel comfortable. I think one of the harder things to deal with, but this is true for any hiking anywhere, is actually dog in rural areas that if there's a hostile dog, what are you going to do? And I don't know that that's so different if you're by yourself or, or with somebody. I'm trying to think about your boogeyman or anything. Did I ever feel any danger? I think ever only would be maybe dogs. Mm -hmm. And I maybe would not be crazy about being by myself in a very remote area without any phone service. But the thing about going to point to point, though, is you tell either these booking things, they got your stuff, they know where you're going next, and somebody would come look for you if you didn't show up. Or even when you're doing it solo, I think you would say, okay, today, you tell the place you just left, I'm headed to wherever. I think you compensate. And also, even though you travel solo, you're often not solo because you meet people on the trail. They might totally. be a different person that you're, you're walking with each day, but I bet you I was only walking by myself half the time. Totally. The time just yes. random people that are also walking. And sometimes yes. it's a local. Sometimes it's not even a fellow hiker. I've walked yes. the, uh, the Cotswold Way was actually more locals I found along the past than the through hikers. And they yes. like walk yes. their kids. And I always thought it was funny too, because Americans tend to go away in the bad weather. We'll go inside on this grizzly Sunday, rainy, they're out walking the kids like a day in the park. I was like, we would never do that. Yes. So I, yes. I think that's fascinating just to see how other people live and you actually notice it at this pace. Yes. Yes. And in fact, when I went with a friend on a group guided tour on the Camino way that went you know, from Portugal coming up the coast of Spain, there were many, many, many Spaniards doing it at that time that it was like the school vacation or whatever. And so it was an unexpected and quite a pleasure that most of the people we encountered were doing this in their own country and also families. Nice. So we, we touched a little bit on considerations that you do, but for somebody that's never attempted a long distance hike, what are some of the things they should be thinking about? Because you don't know what you don't know. So the, we want to pick your brain. Yeah, so I think an easy entry would be to go at least maybe the first time with a guided group in order to get the hang of the, how it all works. I mean, it, it's not that hard to figure out the signage, but maybe for comfort to... The only thing about using a guide is you, it's sort of like somebody else driving the car. You don't always pay enough attention and you're not sure how you got there. Okay. Whereas when you have to figure it out yourself, you really pay attention. Do you know what I mean, Kit? That, yeah, and maybe it yeah. should be depending on your confidence level. I always tell people to do plus one outside their comfort zone. So yes. just push yes. yourself a little bit. So if a little bit means you got a guide with you and other people that you're all going together, if that's your plus one, do that. But if you feel like, yeah, I've traveled, I can work my way around strange cities and all that, then maybe you do the self-guided and the self-guided yes. they plan the itinerary based on what you tell them that you're able to do. They give you the maps, you have emergency numbers. So they're holding your hand at a distance. 
kind of a thing. Yes, yes, I would completely, completely agree with you. I think a lot of fun is to go with a couple of friends and you figure it out on your own. That is sort of an in-between thing. It's not just you trying to like, ooh, ooh, you know, the sign fell down and now I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. To have another person to talk something through is right. really a help. One thing I would say is that sometimes people think that flat walking is going to be the easiest. And I would caution people that's not really so. A uh, kind of a relentless hiking, you know, along a towpath next to a river, that can get pretty hard on your feet and muscles. I think kind of rolly is easy. And so sometimes people mistake flat for easy. It's easy in the sense that your heart rate's not going to get going, but it's not necessarily always that easy on your muscles. The other thing I would say is to build in a little rest. If you're going to be going for more than, say, a week, is to take a holiday from your walking holiday and just sit or be in a city or, or, or take a break from that is, is something that I learned on the, on the much long weeks. Yeah, totally agree. And I would interject on that is to check with the tour company and say, of these towns, which is the prettiest, which would be the best to take the rest day? Because yeah. uh, I remember I stayed in Rorardinen on the West Highland Way, even though that was only like day two, but it was a charming town. So I knew I could do a whole week, but I wanted to, to really absorb the whole area on my trip. So there might be cute ones that you want to stop and, you know, just smell the roses for a little bit and then start mm -hmm. out a day later. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to only walk for, you know, three hours, maybe. I, I actually like that idea because yeah. I, a lot of times if you're doing, you know, I have 13 mile feet. So they're starting to be sore around 10, maybe. Mm -hmm. So probably for me, the ideal would be eight to 10. So I'm still ready to go when I make it to town. So then I don't mind walking and wandering all over the place. But if, if I'm there at 13 or 14 miles, I'm tired. My feet so my ready. son made an observation when we were doing a lot of this. It's called the Jakobsweg, J Jacob's Way, Jakobsweg through Switzerland. He made an observation at one point about me. He said, you know, you're about a five hour hiker and you start getting a little grumpy after five hours. So we need to take this into account <laughs> in planning our days. I think I've extended my range a bit, but that was actually a good observation about, yeah, you were talking about miles or kilometers. The walking routes and signs in Switzerland are based more on time. Okay. Because you know, it takes more time to do That's something right, more mountainous, you know. Right, right. And so his observation was about time. He was like, after five hours, and this isn't five hours straight. It would be taking breaks and so on. Right. But that was a good day for me. But I think he's on to something. The other thing I've learned is that sometimes one has the idea or is given the idea that you're going to be at a cute village with a restaurant right when you're hungry for lunch each day. One should not count on that. I, I think <laughs> always, carry, always carry your lunch. And <laughs> snacks. And snacks. And snacks, yeah. yeah. And when you, and if you encounter such a place, then fine. You can decide that's what you're going to do. Or there's some unexpected cafe, you know, mid-morning, then you can have coffee and a snack. But I totally wouldn't count on it. Right, because those villages are spaced a village apart for a reason, and there's often nothing in between but the pretty countryside, so or the woods or wherever it is that you're walking through. Exactly. So talking about packing a lunch and snacks, what do you put in your day pack as a rule? Or what are the, you must put this no matter what? So no matter what, uh, plenty of water, of course. Snacks, always a raincoat. I mean, this was in Portugal. That was a bit of a silly thing, maybe. But I still did because I live in a rainy climate, Portland, Oregon. I've hiked a lot in rainy climates or places where the weather might change. So I think it's super important to always have something because getting wet and drenched through isn't the most pleasant thing. Of course, maps. And even though the world's kind of moved away from paper maps, I still think it's good as a backup I to think it's have too. a paper map. And waterproof it. If you can't find a waterproof one, take some Kyle's craft glue, water it down, paint it over, let it dry really well, put some oh, toxic water cool on idea. it, yeah. flip it over, do the same thing. It'll be a little sticky, but it'll get you through your trip without getting wet. If you happen to get rained on, you can still pull it out to see where you are. Yes. 
Yeah. And when I was thinking about rain gear, a poncho would accomplish the same thing. It doesn't have yeah. to be a, you know, fancy Columbia sportswear, Gore-Tex jacket. I mean, even a poncho would. Right. And mm -hmm. I have a few other items that I like to recommend that I'll put a link to that in the show notes, one of which would be a headlamp, just because I always like to be prepared mm -hmm. if I get really lost that I can spend the night. So I want a headlamp. Exactly. I want my emergency kit. I generally, I've got a thermal puffy jacket that's the size of my fist. It's not the, the thickest in the world, but if I need it and spending the night, that'll, I've got my little things that'll get me through the night if God forbid that should happen. Yeah. yeah. And then I always care. Now this is starting to sound like a lot of stuff, right? But <laughs> Wait, talking ounces. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things on this Camino Way walk that one of the people in the group did, and I started doing, it was the most wonderful thing, which is changing your socks at lunchtime. It's sort of like washing your face or something you, for very little effort. It's very refreshing. And so I've actually started doing that. I mean, we want this walk, we did lawn days. I mean, these were 18 and more kilometers a day, up to even 25, maybe even more. And so that's a lot of time on your feet in your socks. So I would always carry extra socks for just in case, because if your feet get wet, that's the worst thing. Um, yeah, so I put extra socks in a lock bag. That's the a really important thing is make sure everything in your pack is in something waterproof in your pack. I got a good one for you there too. So I take a compactor trash bag, even though I don't even think they sell compactors anymore, but it's a really strong plastic. I line my whole pack in that. Yes. And then that a great then idea. twist it up, fold it over and take a, a heavy duty twist tie to secure it. So it's doubly checked. So nothing is going to get wet because like you said, you don't want the wet gear and B, water's heavy. You don't want to carry yeah. anything. Anything else yeah. you don't want to carry. So take yeah. that outrage. Right? You want to yeah. keep the down, but you, you want to bring what you need, but you want to still keep that weight down. Sunscreen. I mean, yeah. even in a gloomy climate, especially when you're outdoors all day, every day. I mean, maybe not when it's raining in Ireland. Sounds like you've done the West Highland Way. Maybe you actually hiked literally in a downpour. Seems Really, sometimes when you're setting off to this southern aisle lane, but if the sun comes out, it comes out. You can get four seasons in a day, so you need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. but depending in the further north, you could literally have winter in the evening, in the afternoon, and summer in the morning. So you got to be prepared for all that too. What are some of the mistakes that you made early on that now you know better? Oh, wow. What a great question. So one is the waterproofness. I remember when day our, my husband's and my, our money getting soaking wet. Somehow we ended up with our money, like in an outer pouch of one of our pants. I can't remember the details anymore, but it was like, oh man, what a mess. And it rains so hard. This is where your lining your pack is such a smart idea. And now a lot of packs have built-in covers anyway. But everything that it rains so hard that the rain actually went through the pack. You know, so the, the waterproofness was super important. For me, I learned that flat's not easy. So don't have long, long flat days or try to intersperse them if you can. The other is, let me think. Oh, you're thinking, I'm going to interject yeah. something too about the money. You're reminding me, a lot of these little towns may not have ATMs, or if they have ATMs, your credit card or debit card company may not trust the ATM and may not give you money. So when you're in a major city, make sure you have the cash you think you're going to need to get you to the next major city so you don't get left high and dry. Yes, this is very true. And this is a convenience now in Europe that most of it, not all of Europe, but most is on the euro so that at least you don't have to have different piles of money right. depending on where you are. That's a convenience. And and I think that's they're getting better too. I mean, they, I think they were ahead of us on the chip. So you'll find it more often, but still a lot of the little towns, they wanted cash. Yes, yes. And different countries are different about how they like giving change or not, you know, and so it helps to have small bills also. And that your shoes to where you're going. So for example, when my daughter and I did this walk in Portugal, that was mostly country lanes, old medieval, a bit of cobblestone in, in places. Really heavy hiking boots would have been horrible because they would have been too heavy for the situation. 
if you're going to be more mountainous, then you want to have shoes that go over your ankle. One shouldn't assume because you're walking, you're necessarily going to need the heaviest top-notch hiking boots. And this was a mistake I made when my husband and I did this very long trip that had quite a very rain. We ought to have had more than one pair, or we should have shipped ahead a pair for when we got to the different environment. Serious hiking boots are heavy. Even the best ones now, they're heavier. I mean, they're quite a bit lighter than they used to be. But you also don't want to have something flimsy when you're doing something more mountainous or more rocky. Right. I'm just now experimenting with trail runners because I've got an odd trip that I'm planning in Europe that I'm going to be doing all these different things, but I also want to be able to carry everything that I need on my pack if I need to. So I don't need hiking boots and biking shoes and all these different mm-hmm. things. I'm going to try it with trail runners and see how I do. Yes. Yeah. So I have some balance problems. So I always have walking poles with me. And I know there are people who kind of poo-poo them and, but they take the pressure off your knees also. And so this trip in Portugal, especially you wouldn't need walking poles, but for me, it's a bit of a confidence thing. And especially going downhill, I have more difficulty going downhill than I do up. It's like I have afterburners on the way up and then have to pick my way down a little bit. Personally, I trade off the shoes with the hiking poles. So for me, trail runners and hiking poles work in even more difficult situations that you might think you need more serious boots. Does that make sense? Yes. And that really makes me feel better about my decision too. And I like you, I don't care what the train is. I like hiking poles, not just for the balance, but I think they help you with your rhythm and I'm clumsy. So I fall. And so they save me from countless falls because it it gives me extra touch points. And so I catch myself all the time. And at the end of the day, your feet are tired and you tend not to lift them up as high as you should. And that's when you trip over the little rocks and the stumps and all that. And particularly with the heavy hiking boots. So just like those poles. And yes. I, I agree with you. The, the lightest shoe you can get away with. Yeah. That. But if you're truly doing like an alpine trap. Right. If that's what you're doing, get proper shoes. Right. right. <laughs> and well, by I proper, I mean heavier is, duty. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my Bhutan trek, they said, absolutely. You had to have hiking boots. You, there's no question. We had to do that in the Himalayas. So another thing on shoes, if you don't mind talking about shoes more, is that, as I've said, I live in a rainy climate. And so my shoes are all we trail runner, whatever, high serious boot, you know, all my gradations of shoes are all waterproof. And then I did a trip in Utah a couple of years ago, and the same would apply in Portugal, where the The REI store here in Portland said the thing about waterproof boots is that actually your feet get hot. Yes. And if you're going to be in a place where it's dry, don't take, don't, if you can afford it to have multiple shoes, leave your waterproof ones at home and have non-waterproof ones. This was very hard for me (laughs) living in a rainy climate to accept, but this was super good advice. And it was true in Portugal, the waterproofing creates a barrier. That's the point. So your feet sweat more, which you don't care about. And the waterproof is more important in a rainy climate. But in a dry climate, the airiness of a non-waterproof shoes is a benefit. And I'll add to that too, because I have hot feet to begin with, so I don't use waterproof shoes. Mm -hmm. But what I always make sure I do have on is wool socks. So even if my feet are wet, first of all, the, the, the... shoes that I have, they breathe so well, they dry really quickly. Yes. And so I don't really worry about it too much, but as long as I have my wool socks, even if I'm cold, my feet are warm and they just, I don't seem to get the mushy, like trench foot of wet feet hiking all day. Yes. And that's another good point about the the shoes drying out quicker if they're not um, waterproof. I usually wear a silk sock liner. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because I find wool, even the nicest smart wool, I find itchy. And so, but definitely something that will be warm and dry. And in addition to try to get the ones with the little toes, because I would get toe blisters and that stopped the toe blisters too. So I always have the liner socks, but now I'm into the toe kind. 
Okay, here's another mistake is that never push past the point where you start feeling like you might be getting a blister. The instant, the instant, the nanosecond that you think that you might be getting a blister is stop and deal with it because it won't get better. Right. And it can get where I'll put a link to the wilderness first aid one too, where Casey talks about as soon as you feel that hot spot, yeah. take care of it. And they even moleskin, I have problems having that stick on me. I think it was Compete is the brand. Yes. It stays on until you like your skin falls off. So that's really yes. good. <laughs> so, and I've used duct tape and I, I wrap a little duct tape around my hiking pole. So I always have a little bit of that handy for all sorts of reasons. But I've used that as, as hot spots. There's, there's lots of different ways you can treat your hot spot if you get there. But that's excellent advice there. So getting back to walking holidays then. So we've, we've talked about the considerations they need to think about. Any other thoughts about planning one? Oh, so one thing I would say is that we, as English speakers, we have the luxury of much of the world speaks English as a second or third language. But you can't be sure, especially in rural areas, where there might be much older people or people don't have a need to speak English. You can't assume that everybody's going to be speaking English. It's not like being in a city. It's pretty tough to find a city <laughs> where you're not going to be able to get by in English. But I guess what I'm saying is a dictionary in some form or a phrase book or a something. I have found myself, this might go into a little bit the advice mistake category. In recent years, I've gotten a little lazy on that and think, well, I can get by, you know, in Portugal, I can get by with the bit of Spanish or whatever. And first of all, that's kind of a not very nice assumption. And, but you can't absolutely be sure that you're not going to end up in a situation where you're going to need to communicate with at least some key words. And I think it's also important to at least learn the polite phrases. Yes. And I'll also put a link to my companion podcast on language learning, particularly for trips and all that, where she gives us some great tips on how we can kind of speed up learning the things that we need to know for a trip. And also don't forget Google Translate can literally you can talk into it and it'll talk to them and translate for them. You yes. can hold it up to a sign and it will translate for you. I don't use it because I try to do the pantomime thing, but it's nice to know I have that in my back pocket if I'm in a real jam. And so I think absolutely critical is please thank you. And absolutely, no matter what, you know, please and thank you. And may I, and I think it's important for walking trips that you know the words for left, right, the direct compass directions and some sense of distance, you know, that, you know, you know, maybe a little bit about ahead, you know, some of these walking kinds of words. That's excellent advice. Yes. Yeah. What, what are the words that you're going to think of the jams you could find yourself in and what would be the words, just basic caveman language. Exactly. Town front, town back. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's a good way of doing you know, it, right? And, and they'll know, they'll, they'll yeah. be able to figure out. And it's amazing how much, even if you speak totally different languages, that you can communicate. Yes. So. But I think the right and left, ahead, right. behind, right. you know, north, south, east, and west, where is, that's probably the, right. <laughs> the key thing. So I think the travel language, but then slightly adapted for being in the out of doors. Correct. Correct. Excellent advice. Can you finish up by telling us some fun stories about your adventures? Favorite so memories? Yeah, so for me, there's two categories, I think, of fun things. One of the things that I think is wonderful about travel is the serendipity nature of what you see and encounter. Isn't it often what you didn't expect that sticks in your head? Like, oh, I'm planning to go to the Louvre and see the Mona Lisa, but really the amazing thing was this other thing I saw. So one thing that I like also in these point to point trips is sometimes there's something amazing and where we would consider nowhere, like an amazing mosaic chapel or something like that. Or, oh my God, this is where so-and-so is from. Who would have guessed? It's like this whole slideshow of memories is going through my head right now about encountering things out 
nowhere that you wouldn't expect to find, like a cool wooden bridge or covered bridge or something like that. For me, a lot of it is the people encounters. I talked a little bit about running into children. I think that's always a lot of fun. I think the fellow travelers are always very interesting. The, as you said, Kit, there's often other people around and what's their story and why are they doing this trip it, it is really interesting. So for me, it's more the cumulative collection of impressions and memories that I think is so meaningful. I would say that's true. And are you familiar with the phrase type two fun? Type no. two? Okay, type one fun is when you're out, you're having a great time and you get home and you're all so excited. It was a great time. Type two fun was it was really hard. You're like, why have I done this? What was I thinking? I hate this. I want to be home. And then you get home and say, man, that was awesome. Have any of your walking holidays been type two fun? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and oh, absolutely. Do you like that type two fun. Yeah. Like, why did I think this would be fun? You know, definitely. It's, I think the thing about walking also is that you can get tired. And I think you mentioned, kid, about getting up the next day and then you get up the next day and the next day. The, this is why I think taking a break from it can be good. It starts to feel like a job a, a little bit. But then there's always this, oh my God, that was so cool. And I wish this would never end. You know, and for me, the, the where I reach the why am I doing this, it tends to be in a rocky downhill environment. Like, why am I here? <laughs> and then it would be, oh, because it's so beautiful. And this was an accomplishment. And this is so cool. Actually, I do have a cool memory that just came to my mind. And this was in the French Alps doing this very long distance, this this Grand Randonnée 5 that goes through the Alps. And by the way, can I say on these long distance European routes, as my son pointed out, because these routes are mostly sub, you know, settled over time, as you said, in medieval times or whenever, they didn't pick the hard way to go. This was not the goal for the people from one village to the next. Oh, let's go over the top of the mountain. It's, let's go through the pass. Now, some of the walking routes now are adapted to make them more interesting, and sometimes that's the harder way, but very often the way through, like the way through the Alps, sometimes, you know, we cross the Alps on foot, people picture that we were going up and down over mountain peaks. No, we weren't. It was hard, but it was through passes. There was one point where th this often happens, I think, in walking trips. You walk all day to get somewhere where people had pull up in their cars. Or you're there in your hiking shoes and then there are these women in their high heels or teenagers in their flip-flops. It's like, how are we in the same part of the planet? So one time my husband and I in the French Alps, we walked out, we were all by ourselves all day long. It was like we were the only people on the planet. We get to wherever we are spending the night. There were several cars and there was a herd of goats licking the oil off of the back of the cars. These goats loved oil. Interesting. It was an interesting thing. And then the people at the inn explained it to us. Then the next day when we took off, then, you know, the other people who were spending the night left in their cars, we went on this kind of goat route, continuing on our way. These goats were just ahead of us as a herd and they were helping each other along this path. It was like the coolest thing that we would not have encountered had we done what other people were doing, which is drive up, see this beautiful site and drive away. Is they just offer you a, just a different, unique way to explore, to meet people that you would have no chance of meeting. And they're like-minded people. And they're all, they seem to be all interesting people because boring people don't do things like this. Yes. You know, yes. so they've, or they've couch all... potatoes yeah. or people yeah. Yeah, who can't stir themselves. And can I just say, I say would like to food. say to your listeners, people yeah. do not have to be super fit to do a, a, a walking trip. Now, I would recommend practicing ahead of time, what, you know, pushing your envelope a little bit if you don't walk very much. 
But on this Camino Way walk I did, there was a group. There were probably 12 or so women in total. There was a super fast group. There was a middle group. I was like the fastest of the middle, but I was definitely in the middle. There were two women who were way slower than the rest of us. They did not have one bit less good experience for being so much slower than the rest of us. And in fact, they tended to see things we would find out at the end of the day that especially the super fit, super fast group didn't even see at all because they were racing along so quickly. And why were they slow? One of them, because she wasn't that fit and the other just like walking slow. And so that's the other thing about walking is that you don't have to be a marathon runner to pull it off, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And you have all day to get to the end. You have all day. So if you're walking, say, an average of 12 miles, even if you're going, and these are easy paths, so surely probably two miles an hour. Yeah. Surely two miles an hour, everything. And to take the time to stop and sit. You don't have to race. It's not a a marathon anyway, because you're there to enjoy it and see it. So how about some final thoughts? And I'll let you go. You've been generous with your time, and I've taken you long. Well, I have really appreciated, Kit, this chance to talk to you, and the timing's been wonderful. So I really appreciate this this, uh, chance to get excited again about traveling. And that also reminds me, one of the reasons travel's so fun is you get to the excitement of thinking about it, the excitement of doing it, and the fun and joy of reliving it afterwards. Absolutely. Pre-COVID, my goal was to do one walking holiday a year. My sister Terry and I are hoping to do the England's Coast to Coast Walk and do another one in Ireland one day. I'm hoping to be back on track next year since I've gotten caught up in all my postponed tours. If walking holidays are of interest to you, I did a few previous shows that may be of interest as well, and I'll put links in the show notes. I did one on the UK's best walking holidays and how to plan a walking holiday. And I'll also put in the show notes links to all the walking holidays I've covered so far on the podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, can I ask you to take a minute right now? I'll wait. Go ahead. Hold on. I'll wait. And share it with two of your adventurous friends. Word of mouth is how folks find out about podcasts. I'd very much appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed learning about walking holidays today. I sure appreciate you listening. Until next time, this is Kit Parks. Adventure on. Adventure on.